I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food. Today's program is brought to you by 100 Bogart Street, a co-working and event space in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Learn more at 100bogart.com. I'm HRN's Executive Director, Katie Mosman-Wadler, with a preview of this week's episode of Meet and 3, our weekly food news roundup. Last month, Hurricane Florence walloped parts of North Carolina. According to the Weather Channel, it was the wettest tropical storm to ever hit the Tar Heel State. So how did the restaurant industry respond? Some helped FEMA weather the storm, while others got to work feeding people on the ground. We just walked in and said, we know how to cook, what can we do? They said, I need you guys to just cook 150 pork loins, and we were just like, uh, okay. (laughs) Now the attention needs to be on Florence's long-term effect on North Carolina's farming community. The general mood of farmers is one of certainly resilience and almost feels like it's the normal course of business to just get hit by a gigantic hurricane and need to just keep on going. So tune in to this week's Meet and 3 on Heritage Radio Network, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to The Line. I'm your host, Eli Sussman. My guest today is Josh Wu, managing partner of Winsun, the popular Taiwanese-American restaurant located in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Wu originally is from Queens and is a first-generation Taiwanese-American. His parents immigrated here in their mid-20s so his father could attend school. Wu is not a chef, so he's actually an unusual and exciting guest for the show. His background is based more in operations and construction before getting involved in the restaurant industry. In 2014, Wu and his friend Trig Brown, a chef, began discussing opening a restaurant together. They visited Wu's family in Taiwan and ate extensively, helping educate themselves about dishes that would end up influencing the food they've created at Winsun. They opened in May of 2016 and have received praise from multiple outlets, including a Best of 2016 from The Village Voice. They're currently developing a new project, which hopefully we'll talk about towards the end of the show, a casual Taiwanese cafe set to open, maybe, in 2019. Josh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. So, as we always do on the program, we'll start at the beginning. Your mom is from, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Tainan? Yeah, Tainan, yeah. One of the oldest cities in Taiwan. Uh, What prompted your uh, mother and father to move to the United States? Uh, Just seeking more opportunity. And, uh, you know, they met in church, and there's a very strong, uh, I guess, presence with the group that they were with uh, in the States. And uh, that was just, you know, the, the move to, to start a family, move to America. And uh, they did it at a time when they were, you know, able to, to you know, smoothly transition, I guess. So you were born in Queens. Yeah. Are you the oldest? You have two siblings, correct? I'm right in the middle. So I got an older sister, Marianne, who's three years older. She lives out in Little Neck right now with her uh, husband and two kids. And my younger sister, who's out in Anaheim, California, finishing up grad school. So when they moved here, did they move to a area of New York in, in Queens that had a big population of people from Taiwan, or were they, and you as a child, sort of isolated? Um, no. So they actually, when they came over, uh, well, I guess before I was born, they lived in Atlanta. So they uh, they rented a room um, at a, a brother's house, basically a brother in the church, and they spent a few years there and uh, I think they conceived basically moved up to New York and had my older sister at that time they were living in Jamaica Queens and uh, eventually moved to Fresh Meadows and and, and so and so when they moved up to New York was it in pursuit of something specific your father was going to 
be going to grad school, I believe, in order to further his education, right? Yeah. So uh, he's an accountant by trade, and uh, he has uh, pretty much a, a knack for starting his own business. And so he's definitely one of those, you know, serial entrepreneurs. Um, they uh, they ran a gelato business out in Long Island in Roslyn Heights growing up. And then uh, that didn't do so well. So then they moved on to uh, kind of the deli supply, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, distribution. So they did like a lot of snacks, like granola type snacks, uh, the I guess, first wave gourmet style stuff. So they were sort of in the food industry. They, they, at they the were beginning. They for were. Sure, yeah. They were definitely involved in that. Uh, I'm curious if your house was a Mandarin speaking house, or if it was. Did you respond in English? Um, and also about kind of what the the culture was like in the home. You're a first uh, generation American. I, I'm curious about whether the was there a rebellion by you and your siblings to kind of say, we want to be known as American, or did you define as Taiwanese American? What was that like? I think, yeah, I'm one of those first generation kids who kind of rejected a lot of my uh, other attributes, I guess, because I grew up in a largely like white neighborhood. Um, although there are a lot of, you know, there's maybe two other Asian kids at my school. Um, you know, some Jewish kids some Dominican kids and we all basically we all hang out to hung out together and uh and it was great uh but I definitely uh you know wanted to eat spaghetti and pizza all the time and uh and yeah what was the first part of your question uh, it knows just what was that that like I mean you you say you want to eat spaghetti and pizza all the time so <laughs> w- w- were your parents cooking traditional Taiwanese dishes and right. you were like I just want to go to the mall and speak English and kind of reject <laughs> my household and my heritage? Or was it like this push and pull always between uh, the culture of your home and maybe the culture of your school? I think uh, in that sense, yeah, my mom definitely bent towards um, the Western culture in the home um, more than like, you know, isolating our, like uh, the kids. Uh, so uh, basically we, we grew up speaking Chinese at home, um, but then as I grew older, when I was in like second or third grade, I was having trouble with my English. And so uh, at that time, the idea was to stop speaking a secondary language at home in order to have your kid focus on um, English, I guess. I was in ESL. I think since then, it's kind of flipped over and people are realizing that, you know, if you keep pushing it, you know, it'll eventually catch up or whatever. And so... What do you mean That's, it's flipped over? Like like, uh, like nowadays, everyone wants to raise their kids bilingual, um, and it's more like I guess supported by I guess uh, studies or like kids that have you know more kids that have gone through that. And I think uh, at the time when I was growing up, I think my guidance counselor or whoever was my teacher at the time was you know like you guys should stop talking to your son in Chinese. He's having like trouble in uh, in school. Um, so yeah, my mom, you know, started learning more English at the time, and she actually was an English major in Taiwan. Um, I don't really know; <laughs> she wasn't able to retain much of it. I mean, nowadays, but uh, yeah. Um, so now I pretty much have like a second graders uh, Chinese, uh, you know, capability. I don't, I don't really. So you can like illiterate. have a two minute long conversation in <laughs> in Mandarin with your mom, basically. Yeah. Yeah, no, nothing, nothing great. Um, maybe a little bit more than that. I'd say like three and a half minutes, maybe. <laughs> uh, I'm. I want to know about the the mid '90s. Your parents were trying out various businesses with varying degrees of success. Uh, they ended up separating, and uh, your mom raised you and your two siblings and was working multiple jobs. You've uh, had many jobs that that you uh, told me about before we went on air. Um, it seems like your parents are both hard workers and they instilled in you kind of this, this work ethic. I'm curious about that time in your life, uh, when they split up and you saw your mom working all those jobs, did that light a fire under you to go to college and to jump into the professional workforce? And did you maybe have another passion that you kind of put to the side in in order to do what maybe like was quote unquote right for the family? 
I mean, that that happened when I was a little bit too young to be thinking about those things. Mm-hmm. But um, I think it, it, what it did was it made me a very like angry kid, and I guess a better word to put it would be like passionate about whatever I was doing. And so, um, you know, uh, my mom got me into uh, the Boy Scouts. Uh, we blows early on, and so I spent a lot of time like outside. Um, and you know, how would I say? My, my little sister was was still a baby, and so like I spent a lot of time, you know, with her as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't think that really like passion for for any direction really came until I was in college. And so you went to Baruch College, yeah. and. And after that, uh, it seems like you got involved in uh, the real estate property world of New York City, which very aggressive business, pretty cutthroat. Can you talk a little bit about how you got involved in uh, in property management and then some of the aspects of that job that you uh, worked in a- after that in the next following years? Yeah, so um, I got in because my dad started uh, – bookkeeping for landlords and this is like in the 90s and uh early 90s and he's and it was a good time to get into real estate from what i understand um there's a huge auction in 96 the city held uh, a lot of properties around here actually i like this old auction book which is really a cool coffee book i can't find it right now but you know you have like you know warehouses and plots of land you know like 2500 square feet plots of land for like a couple thousand dollars and you got buildings uh, crazy stuff like that, but um, he owned a few properties uh, in Brooklyn and in the Bronx, and so after college, I uh, I managed with him those properties, and eventually, you know, I started managing for him because he wanted to step away uh, or work on other things outside of New York, and uh, and that's kind of how I got into it. Um, I wouldn't say it's as Cutthroat. I feel like you're refer- more so referring to like you know a lot of the, uh, I guess uh, investing and like uh, the buying and selling of properties maybe, but I, I, you know it could be too. Is, you know it, the city is pretty cre- aggressive um, in certain areas, and uh, a lot of my job was just to clean up, and uh, and maintain and uh, within budget I guess, and so. So when you say property manager, can you dive a little deeper into that? Is that yeah. a of the role of a super? Are you managing the building directly, or are you just kind of the guy at the top who's collecting rent, paying bills and taxes, and you know making sure that the building right. lights stay on, things right. like that? Like that? It's basically all of that. Okay. So um, it's a smaller portfolio. Um, so basically, a property manager. I guess there are different types of property managers out there. Some are more uh, refined, other are more uh, a little bit more raw. Um, but you know, day to day, you're in charge of you know hiring, and managing employees, whether it's a super or porter. Um, some people have different responsibilities, or can do certain things. Um, you know, you're kind of on, you're, you're kind of like the emergency guy. So you're on call 24 hours a day. If something goes out, the boiler goes out. It's gas leak, um, electrical issue, you know, you got called out. And a lot of the buildings that I was managing were kind of uh, not really well maintained. And so you'd have a lot of situations where um, I'd have to find uh, good people to work with that knew, you know, what they were doing. And uh, and I learned a lot from those, those guys that I worked with. But uh, I think a lot of the work uh, was in the office too because um, you're, you know, processing paperwork uh, I manage a lot of uh, Section 8 subsidized, rent subsidized apartments, and those are very paperwork heavy um, because the city's involved, like HPD or NYCHA is, you know, taking a part of uh, the rent, essentially. And so there's a lot of uh, certifications involved and inspections with them. And uh, I'd say the, the, the most stressful part, I think, of, of managing properties is is dealing with like certain types of tenants, um, trouble tenants, maybe people that don't pay rent or uh, people that, you know, sabotage their apartment that you have to deal with in order to get the certification for them to pass and continue paying rent. And it's very boring stuff. Um, but but you, but <laughs> the thing is, is that what you've just listed is 25 things that all happen within restaurants that usually 
the chef or the owner doesn't have any background experience in, right? They've worked the line somewhere. Right, they've, right. they've cooked, but they don't know how to fix a boiler. They don't know what a gas leak smells like. So you, you learned so many of these things. I hope they know what a gas leak smells like. <laughs> <laughs> they learned you, you, you were doing so many of these things while managing that portfolio. Um, did a light bulb go off in your head and you say like, wow, I've got all these things that I can apply to, a business of my own and that business could be a restaurant business or at that time did you really think to yourself I'm going to continue to buy buy a building maybe with my dad or on my own and I'm going to be like a real estate guy was that sort of the path that you were on at, at that point no um I mean looking back like I, I see that now and maybe like as we're opening the restaurant I saw I started to see more of it because of the build out um but back then I was just so deep into it and uh kind of in the shits uh, with uh, with the building conditions and stuff like that, that I, I I was just like, man, I'm stuck here, and my dad needs my help, and uh, there's no one else that really wants to work for him. So it's I have this long thing o- ahead of me, and b- the restaurant actually became something of a of an out for me um, once it became like uh, stabilized and I could focus all of my energy um, and time on that. So you were feeling kind of stuck in this job that sort of your dad maybe strong-armed you into working for him a little bit. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, were you were you learning, you know, how to resurface floors, like put up drywall? Are you gaining all these kind of like practical construction skills at this time, or yeah. was that not really part of it? No, that was totally part of it. Um, so, you know, I, I was among the, you know, being a property manager, you you go to the sites, you know, if, if there's a renovation you're doing in a contract that a contractor that you hired, you know, you got to check up on the work. Um, you got to make sure they're putting uh, the wall in the right place. So it's a nice, nice layout. You know, people want to come and rent a, a nice apartment, not with like, you know, a weird uh, a room somewhere off in the middle, you know, like things that you can adjust and knowing the outline like or the uh, the layout. You know the plumbing layout. Let's say the waistline's here. You know, uh, plumbing's over here. So you want to consider those things, obviously, and uh, and try to save as much money as possible and and get it done as soon as possible. So it's a lot of like just managing other people um, is a huge part of that, and uh, also you know kind of team building. You know, like any small business. Um, and so I think that's what really excited me the most about that job was just the people that I got to work with. And uh, and how we were able to work together and encourage each other and and do something cool. Was it pretty satisfying for you? And is it still satisfying for you when something during the build out or maybe still to this day, like a freezer or fridge goes down and you think to yourself, well, I'm going to be able to take a look at that and probably troubleshoot it before you drop 500 bucks or a thousand bucks on bringing somebody in to fix it. Like, totally. That's part of the sort of awful part of a restaurant is that everything continuously breaks. It's just the wear and tear on a restaurant is extreme, right? Like it's tons of people, uh, tons of opening and closing door, everything. Right. So, um, now looking back, are you kind of, uh, like, how do you look back on that time and think about all those things that you were learning on the job? I, I mean, I think about it, you know, today, you know, like, uh, because, you know, anytime there's a problem that comes up, you know, you just learn like a better way to deal with certain things. And so I have like this maintenance support guide for management staff that's very, you know, specific to our uh, appliances and locations and stuff. And uh, and we have this great manager, Patrick, who uh, who's pretty handy. Um, and I think uh, it, it's, that's really, I guess, we, you know, what you were referring to before kind of shows its... Uh, head from my work experience in these things and it's nice because we don't have to spend those few hundred dollars here and there on things that we could just fix ourselves um and kind of just developing a culture of maintaining as you go um has kind of been our mo especially with cooks and uh, servers you know we have servers clean a lot more than other restaurants clean our cooks you know break down and uh set up and break down their own stations as well as you know squeegee you know everything right um all the nine so um, I think that's just a continuation of that, and it's it's cool to see that people are invested and want to do this. And uh, not that we want to take advantage of them or anyone, but it's nice. Uh, How did did you get people to buy into that type of mentality? It's basically what you're saying is you know 
there's a ton of work that gets done by the staff at the restaurant. Um, it's that's awesome that they you know come in every day and and bust really hard f- for you and for the restaurant and for their coworkers. But like, how did you and Trig kind of create that culture at the restaurant? Um, I don't know. I guess it's a couple things. You know, we were there all the time. And uh, when we're there, we're focused. Of course, you know, we joke around a little bit to keep it light. But um, I think just setting a good example, you know, day in and day out um, and treating people with with respect as much as you can, um, even in stressful moments. Um, And also, like, we've been fortunate enough to be so busy, you know, and I think the financial benefit also helps, right? And, you know, guys that have worked with, we have a few people that have worked with us since the beginning, and uh and you know they're artists or uh designers outside of it and and so they've been able to kind of carve out a niche and they're comfortable and they know how we like to run things and it's just easy for them right uh maybe you know not so easy maybe it's the wrong thing to say but it's 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 comfortable and uh and they work hard and so it's a it's a great i guess business relationship and you know, we not you know we work with these people, but we also are friends with them, and uh, not to like a you know a fake extent, but you know very casual, and we care. So it's you know it's just pretty crazy that we're even in this situation, and uh, yeah, it's just keep going, I guess. We're gonna take a quick break, and when we come back, we're gonna talk about the opening of Windsun and uh, and the new project as well. Stick with us here on the line on Heritage Radio. One Hundred Bogart has made much progress over the past year since their grand opening. They are a growing community of professional freelancers, entrepreneurs, and startups. Their dedicated team guarantees you receive a productive and worry-free work environment. One Hundred Bogart is currently filling up their two-person to twelve-person private offices. The spacious pop-up gallery, premier rooftop, and brand new full floor with terrace are available for your next event. Podcast rooms, conference rooms, and meeting spaces are also available for booking. 100 Bogart hosts events like art exhibitions, pop-up stores, product launches, and fashion shows. Heritage Radio Network is a proud member of the 100 Bogart community and often holds events in the building. Visit 100bogart.com to schedule a tour and learn more. Welcome back to The Line here on Heritage Radio. My guest today is Josh Wu. He's the managing partner of Winsun, the popular Taiwanese-American restaurant in Williamsburg. Uh, right before the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, the, the culture and, and people really buying into keeping the restaurant maintained. But before there was even a restaurant there at that location, there was uh, a shell of a building, and you were actually in the process of doing some work on it, but you weren't actually necessarily going to open up a restaurant there. Can you talk a little bit about how Winsun came to be at that specific location? Yeah, so that building is actually owned by my father. And uh, and so I was basically vanilla boxing it up to rent out to someone else. And uh, my friend Gwen connected me with a few folks, uh, this guy that does coffee out of LIC, uh, Chris Peraccini of formerly of Roberta's and his partners at the time. Um, a few other Mediterranean restaurants came by. Um, and everyone was kind of undershooting the asking price. And at the time, Trig and I had started hanging out more because he had moved up from Bushwick to Bushwick from uh, Bed-Stuy. And, uh, and the space kind of became like this, uh, this, child of our you know ideas and like dreams and uh you know we'd always speak about our discontent with our um our work uh, like anyone else would just you know complain and, and and moan about whatever things that was going on that day especially after a long day and uh we kind of thought it would be a cool thing to to do our to, to do our own business together um and i didn't really know him that well at the time and you know um 
especially like a restaurant endeavor is a huge uh, risk um, financially and also like with time because he was kind of on, on his way up, like opening a successful restaurant as a sous chef and uh, and entertaining possible, you know, promotions. But I think the culture that he was in, especially like the, the, uh, the culture that he, he was in at work, he really didn't like and he wanted to get out of that. And um, for me... Uh, you know, I was managing uh, for my father as well as a few other landlords at the time, and um, I had a property manager that had been uh, working with me for almost two years at that point, and uh, and basically, you know, she was very, uh, I guess, motivated to do her own thing, and so eventually, what I decided after we decided on taking the space, um, she eventually took over uh, the properties I was managing over like a transition period of like a year. So, um, it worked out. So you kind of get out of the property management game altogether and decide to open up a restaurant in this space that you are white boxing, hopefully for another tenant. And then it just kind of spoke to you in a certain yeah. way. Uh, when you're, when you're opening up those discussions with Trig, I, I mean, the, the story that's been written about a lot is that you met at a friend's barbecue and you guys started talking about food and obviously you found similar interests on yeah. a lot of different planes, but was there an original discussion about it being not a Taiwanese American yeah. restaurant? Like what were the earlier discussions about and how did you settle on Winsun becoming Winsun? Uh, practically speaking, you know, we, 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 you know, we approach it like a business, right? Like what's your experience? What's my experience? what's the most logical thing we could do. And that was just obviously new American, you know, or Italian food, um, because of ex his experience at Kraft, um, and other, other restaurants, but he, he, he spent a lot of time at Kraft. And so a lot of what he picked up there, you know, kind of lent itself to those types of cuisines. Um, but I think it kind of came down to what was, going on at the time we were talking about this and uh and, and my background and what i like to eat and we were hanging out in flushing and bayside a lot um eating at restaurants that i grew up going to and uh with no agenda really and it just became obvious to us that you know a lot of my friends and a few of his friends that went out to eat and explored like were foodies uh, quote unquote, um, would we'll go out to Queens, you know, and how would they get there? They take the subway, they take an Uber or a taxi cab. I don't know. I forget what was, uh, Uber was around back then. But, uh, you know, I, I think what eventually occurred was that, you know, we, we wanted to bring that closer to, you know, folks in Brooklyn, North Brooklyn specifically, because, uh, you know, I'd lived there for a decent amount of time and, uh, and he was around a decent amount of time and, it became more and more of a reality considering um, other factors like Eddie Wong with Bauhaus um, and his uh, cool but short-lived uh, restaurant Xiao Ye, um, as well as uh, Jeremy Lin's Nick's debut. It was kind of like this Taiwanese craze um, for a lot of, I think, Asian Americans especially, and then, of course, other folks. But uh, it felt like, you know, Taiwan was on the map more than ever, and uh, an, op an opportunity was there for us to, to try something new and create our own market. That's cool. So you actually did, you did look at a void in the marketplace and say, all these, you know, cool kids, all these foodies that are in Williamsburg and Bushwick and, and, um, and Greenpoint, like, where are they going? Okay, they're going super far away. Maybe yeah. we can create something for them right here. So you start conceptualizing this idea. It kind of starting to solidify as what it could be. Did you uh, take it out to friends, family, uh, in order to try to gain investment? Did you borrow from a bank? I'm curious about the business side of things. Once you and Trig said, all right, let's do this. Um, did you find other partners to bring on board? What was that process like? So um, a lot of the capital investment was just my savings. And uh, I was still managing up until a year, um, our year anniversary of opening. And so uh, funding it, basically, I was working two jobs. And uh, and just poured my money into it until we started breaking even earning money back, which we were very fortunate to do. Um, but we also got uh, a, an investment from our fathers. Um, 
of 50k, and so that helped buffer, you know, our, our checking account, so we didn't have to uh, ride too close. And uh, you know, hindsight, it was probably one of the greater investments that both of our dads have made. So that's uh, pretty sweet, um, you know, to be able to take care of them for uh, for what they gave us. So, uh, but it was it was it was it was just us. Um, and what was the second part of your question? Uh, so you touched on something, multiple things, which are like pretty shocking in this day and age, which is one, almost all the money came from you, which yeah. is pretty rare. Number one. Number two, uh, you guys basically didn't have to look any further than just your family, which is, oh, which so is also we, rare, right? So actually, before we hit our dads up, <laughs> we actually... Uh, we, so we, that's the second part of your question that I totally forgot. We, we, we pitched it to several people. Mm-hmm. Um, my buddy Zach, who runs uh, Babies, and uh, he's opening one out in LA. We asked him, you know, we pitched it to him. We pitched it to this guy, Steve, who, uh, who comes from like a Chinese restaurant family. Um, so there were a few people that we pitched the project to uh, for, you know, investment and uh we turned up you know with zero uh, return on that so um you know we, we definitely did our research and we we did our work in terms of you know trying to get people on board um but what's what's crazy though is that you in such a short amount of time became successful which is not the norm um it must have been pretty terrifying for you to shift all your money from personal bank account to win sun <laughs> bank account yeah. um what do you attribute the success of the restaurant for? You're running like multiple hour waits some nights, like you you turn and burn, you do a lot of covers and a really small footprint. You right. only have what, 35, 40 seats we about? Have, yeah, we have uh, 43 seats. Um, and, you know, we could expand or flex depending on the, the table chart. But uh, yeah, no, it's, you know, we're, we're a small, medium restaurant, and it's crazy the weights we have, and it's crazy the peop- the shit people say when they hear the weights that we have, and, um, you know, it's obviously, you know, no complaints, um, but you're definitely dealing with a different type of customer sometimes um, once you're at this level, I guess, and, and that's always been kind of interesting to me. Um, Was that surprising to you guys that, like, right from the jump you were... Two parts. Right from the jump, you were busy, and also that after a year, you were already, you know, semi-profitable or yeah, turning I left a my profit. Job, yeah. yeah, that's that's pretty wild. Like, it, I would imagine that you didn't necessarily expect either of those things going in, or maybe you right. did. I don't know. What was that like? Um, it just yeah, it was. It, it's very crazy. I always say that. Just crazy. Um, you know, those kind of like a way to wrap it up. Tell me more, kind of style, but. Uh, I think what happened, you know, I, I was, it was just growing at a pace where I could just barely have enough time to adjust my personal life or other things that I was doing to accommodate for it. And what I mean by that is, is I guess, you know, I, I, like I stopped doing a lot of other things that I would normally try to do when the restaurant was going on. And so, um, uh, but in a way where I like accepted it and embraced it and, you know, and really pushed, pushed forward, um, but yeah, it's just how busy we are um, and what we've done, and I guess in the past, you know, three years uh, has been very, you know, uh, uh, just, we're just super grateful for it. And uh, we're happy that we have this team that uh, believes in it so much and that we're able to take care of them um, to a point where, uh, you know, that, that they're happy too. Um, and we definitely hope so. Um, and I think like this kind of ongoing, continuous, open communication that we have with our management staff, as well as, you know, our servers, back waiters, bartenders, cooks and all that, uh, you know, we, we, it's a very small family. And I think our concerns are changing now, obviously, as we grow and it's, you know, how, okay, well, how are we going to able to maintain this, um, this sense of identity and, uh, tight, tight group, uh, mentality as we open another place and so like that's number one on our mind is how do we maintain people's uh you know job satisfaction i guess or uh help other people that work for us give them the space to grow 
um, while, you know, continuing, you know, business as usual. Um, I think that's like, I think one of the major challenges is what I realized is that, uh, well, for food bi- or any, any business really is, is if you, like the rate that you're growing and the rate that people are uh, gaining experience and, and, and doing their jobs, um, if you're able to keep these good ones, right, uh, with you as you grow and uh, be able to hire people to kind of take over for them, um, I think that's kind of the balance that we're focused on uh, in growing and the concerns that we're dealing with now. Now that the restaurant has been open for, for a while, have you been able to back away a little bit? Are you kind of throwing yourself headfirst into it because you don't have the second job kind of weighing you down anymore? Curious what a typical day looks like for you uh, in and around Winsome. Yeah, so the past six months, I've pretty much had like a, a nine to five situation. So I'll be at the restaurant five, six days a week, uh, nine to five. Sometimes I'll stay late depending on if I have friends coming in or a uh, VIP guest, uh, so to speak. And um, that's kind of flip-flopped since we opened uh, in a way. Uh, but, you know, right now we're, you know, we're, we're so busy and we've, you know, staffed up pretty hard as much as we can. Uh, we still have a few vacancies we need to fill. But it's very manageable for us to do that, run the business. Um, and right now, I guess as you know, my role is really, uh, the construction development design guy in terms of setting it up and then, you know, operations on the other side of that. And so we're starting this new restaurant. And so like my schedule is pretty much, uh, back to how it was when we first opened. Um, and right now Trig is, this is like his, uh, he has like more time to himself now before, you know, as soon as we open, cause he's not going to have much time once we open, and uh or just before we open for development and you know setting systems up and so uh it's like this tag team thing that we have going on which is great and you know we definitely complement each other in terms of our skill set and work experience for for the business we're running and uh and yes like schedule wise yeah it's uh it's pretty much nine to five nine to eight type of thing depending on what's going on now that that now that this new project is sort of crystallizing and it's becoming a lot more real can you talk about uh what it is going to look like and feel like uh it's right basically next door to the to the existing restaurant what's the goals there and what are your hopes for it so our goals there uh is to basically do what we couldn't do at Winsun, like like partially, right? So, um, takeout and delivery is uh, is small for us at Winsun because of the way our kitchen is set up. It's a little bit smaller, and we don't have like a place to distribute. You know, let's say takeout besides the bar, and um, the only delivery service we use right now is Caviar. We have a great uh, contract with them, but we also uh, shut them off as soon as we get busy at the restaurant and so um that's limited and so we want to do we want to you know, for the next space we want to you know basically be able to pump out takeout and delivery um and have that as a more considerable source of uh income um as well as just the the pace of service uh we're gonna have an order at the counter you know a customer comes in takes a number sits down and has their meal you know kind of uh, more fast casual i guess um but the new thing that we're doing for the next place to kind of push the Taiwanese food agenda is we'll have uh, a small sample of Taiwanese breakfast items as well as coffee. We want to be a great coffee shop for people. We'll be serving a variety of coffee, uh, one of my favorites, and uh, and as well as uh, pushing soy milk onto people because soy milk is a staple of uh, kind of East Asian uh, breakfast or uh, diets, at least you know mostly in Taiwan, but in other places too. What's the time frame on that project? Uh, we've been saying March, and that's what I'm aiming for. And uh, so far, we're we're on schedule. Um, just have to, uh, you know, get a few permits in. And uh, yeah, permits. How does your past life uh, help you out when it comes to dob and zoning? Like, do you have a? Do you feel like you have a vast? knowledge of that are you in the are you in the dark like everyone else who is a restaurant owner who has to deal with 
all the complications of doing business in New York, one of the most confusing cities to really run up a food establishment. In. Yeah, I uh, I feel like I have a leg up there just because of uh, my work experience prior. So in college, I took some time off and uh, I wanted to switch gears. I wanted to, you know, and like pursue architecture. And so before I did that, I, I, I went to work in an architecture firm, uh, at just, you know, doing bitch work, drafting and uh, just working for other architects, mm-hmm. getting their uh, five years in. And so um, their hours in, sorry. And, uh, and through that, you know, I learned a lot about site inspection from an architect's or drawing perspective, as well as expediting work. And so I would run downtown uh, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, DOB, and uh, I learned my way around there um, through working there, and as well as property management too, because DOB does a lot of uh, regulating for you know uh, boiler work. So they're the main um, regulatory body for the city for you know uh, larger, I guess, uh, systems like building heating systems. Um, as well as you know ventilation systems and all that um, well, that didn't really deal with much of those but it was, you know a lot of uh, those types of things and so um, I guess what I'm trying to say is uh, yeah just from working at you know as a drafts person and then working in property management um, I knew where to start I guess if I ever didn't know how to do something I knew where to go I knew where I had to go to talk to someone and I'm actually very fortunate to uh to have uh this guy Scott I won't say his last name but uh he advised me on a lot of uh of things when I was starting the restaurant because I'd worked with him before and uh he was an engineer um downtown and uh he kind of you know showed me the ropes and how to deal with DOB but uh that was you know good three, four years ago, you know, a lot of things have changed. Um, so like, uh, nine 11 after nine 11 happened, um, the DOB, the city focused on, you know, basically, uh, purging the city f- for mostly like fire rating, uh, and asbestos investigations. And so they were kind of going out to revisiting, uh, auditing all these old buildings and like looking for places where, you know, this, issue would come up and then, you know, having the landlord mitigate and, uh, and take care of that. And, and I think that's just kind of coming to an end now. And so they hired up back then like crazy. And I think pretty much at this point they've finished doing that. And so they have a lot of, uh, people that, that need work. And, uh, and I heard they also hired like over a hundred people last year. And so what they're doing is, uh, you know, to me is, is great, um, in terms of, you know, providing jobs but i think what it does is it creates more work from the same amount of work that was existing before uh, which ends up being more difficult for you know guys like you and me or people wanting to remodel their home or something uh, um, what ends up happening is you get people that aren't as experienced or or know the, the rules the laws and uh and it just causes uh it just creates more waiting time and uh and issues i guess before things can kind of get started what advice would you give to someone who finds themselves in a similar scenario to what uh, you found yourself in before Winsun? You had a good job. You were you were doing well. You had a career with a positive trajectory, right? And uh, you really, really wanted to change and do something else. And you found a partner that seemed right to you. Um, you had a lot of the pieces in place with you and Trig in order to make it successful, but nothing is guaranteed. So what type of advice would you give to someone who's maybe considering a career change and thinking about opening up a restaurant by themselves or with a partner? I think uh, what really guided me um, through these jobs, I mean, I, I'd say I had a few. I, I don't think it's so many, but they are definitely all over the spectrum in terms of uh, industry. But um, is basically seeing things through, you know, everyone has like a kind of discomfort or a kind of level of commitment that they're not sure of, uh, whenever, wherever they're working. And I don't, I don't know if that's the, the most folks or just, you know, the way I thought things were, but, uh, I just never gave up. Right. And so I, I, 
even if I felt like I hated what I was doing, I didn't see me doing it for very long. I didn't stop working hard at it. And uh, I kept that in my back pocket, you know, until something came up or an opportunity came up where I could pursue something with more, you know, interest and passion. And that became like this restaurant project that we did. Um, But I'd say, yeah, uh, you know, put in the time with whatever you're doing and just remember why you're doing it in the first place. And then if you are feeling uh, like you need to make it switch or change, you know, you know, uh, don't rush into it. Um, just, you know, make sure, you know, you're, you're patiently approaching it and, and, you know, things will come, you know, uh, that's, that's what you got to hope for. And as long as you're ready and the opportunity comes up, then it'll be fine. But if, if you rush it, then, uh, you, you run the risk of, uh, of wasting some time or money that you're not necessarily prepared to do. You and Trig are obviously in the process of opening up your second restaurant, and it's uh, going to be very close. There's always this kind of nagging feeling in a lot of uh, restaurant tours' minds that um, success is achieved only by uh, multiple locations and by jumping to maybe Manhattan or another market. Uh, do you? And Trig have any type of desire to jump to Manhattan or to open one up in L.A. or New Orleans or something like that? Is that part of a plan for you? Or do you think that Wind Sun will stay a singular Wind Sun and, and not be duplicated or, uh, or, or replicated somewhere else? Uh, you know, we've definitely thought about expanding and, uh, you know, taking that big check if that ever came to us but um i think what we've realized in thinking about that or exercising through that is that you know we're we're reactionary in that sense because you know it depends on what we're working with our tools right so you know what makes us uh i feel so busy and 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 uh, a neighborhood spot is because we are focused on the neighborhood and community building and and doing events with folks that live there and you know and really knowing everyone that comes in and uh, and having this other restaurant across the street kind of ties right into that um, besides being easier to manage physically uh, but I think we like to continue that spirit of of uh, of being involved and I think if we expand. Um, or take these uh, these deals maybe outside outside of the state. You know we're going to lose that, and I think we need to have um, basically the the idea first, uh, or like a, a manager in mind first that's interested in maybe going somewhere or doing something else with us before we can really you know jump into something like that. Um, We've yeah. been talking mostly about the business side and I don't want to forget about the food obviously yes. uh, the menu uh, has a lot of standouts but I'm hoping that in the last couple minutes here you can tell me about one of the things that's either currently on the menu or was on the original menu that is a dish that uh, you and Trig worked on or that was from your childhood that really speaks uh, to you and also is a strong representation of what you're trying to do at the restaurant. Wow. Um, f- we have a decent amount of dishes like that. Uh, but I guess the fly's head, which is a, a heavy garlic chive and uh, pork dish, um, could could be a, a sample of that. I think, you know, cause that, that was the, f- you know, one of the dishes that I loved eating. Uh, and I didn't really get into Taiwanese food until I was in high school, college, you know, to be honest. And so, uh, that was something that I felt like I, I rediscovered, um, in my twenties. And I was like, man, this, what's with this taste? You know, this is, this feels so right. And, uh, and that was one of the first dishes that Trey cooked, um, together. And, uh, and he still talks about it to this day because, uh, we, you know, we were cooking for a possible investor and some friends and, um, he had finished the dish 
and uh, and kind of plated it in this old clay pot that I had um, for like hot pot, and uh, and to keep it warm, he like threw it in the oven, and you know when the garlic chives are are are, are are too done they kind of lose their like brightness and the green that kind of makes it so fun to look at um but uh anyway that's not the point of the story uh so we that that dish exemplifies a lot of things that we're trying to do because um it's originally a chinese dish um a sichuan dish and kind of came over to taiwan um after world war ii uh, along with you know the, the Nationalist Party, Chiang Kai-shek, and, you know, and that it's it's pretty prevalent in Taiwan. I've never been to China, so I can't really speak to how, you know, how available it is there. I'm sure it's very available. Um, but it, it, it's a dish that's tied to the history of Taiwan uh, politically, and uh, and it's it made its way to the States. Um, the first time I had it was at Beigan which is, uh, it's called Main Street Imperial. It's Main Street in Off Horse Harding by, by the LIE. And that's like one of the places that Trick and I love to go to uh, when we're figuring things out. And it became like a, it was like one of the original dishes that we had and that stayed on the menu pretty much um, till this day. And uh, yeah, it, it, it represents kind of like this, this education, what like through eating, you know, it's like you, you, you learn, um, a lot of things through eating food that's maybe you've never had before. And, you know, fly's head, it's called sang ying to. Um, it's called that because of the fermented beans, uh, black beans in the dish. And they look like flies, flies heads. So, um, you know, you can ask a question about it. Oh, this is a Taiwanese dish. Oh no. Yeah. It's, it's, I had it at a Taiwanese restaurant growing up, but it's actually from China. Um, and, and, by way of Taiwan and to New York. Um, and so like this, it's like this whole, you know, getting to know a dish is getting to know, you know, a little bit of maybe Taiwanese history. So I think that's, that's cool. Where can people go to find more of those dishes? Let everybody know the, the address, the location and the hours, please of Winsun. Winsun restaurant is located at one five nine Graham Avenue, Graham, uh, Montrose and Graham, uh, is a cross street. Uh, yeah, and uh, you come in, take a look at our menu outside, uh, or come inside if we're open. And uh, it's best if you come with groups. It's super fun, and you can pretty much order through the entire menu. Uh, open for dinner open seven for, nights a week? or Yeah, so we're closed Mondays. We're open f- dinner Tuesday through Sunday, 5 to 11, and brunch on the weekends from 11 to 3. Josh, thanks for being on the show today and sharing uh, your story and telling us about uh, opening Windsun and the new project, which is hopefully coming in March. Yep. Thanks, Eli, for having me. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Join us here on Heritage Radio every Tuesday for new episodes of The Line. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey, everybody. I'm Nick Latum. And I'm Leah Bonima. And we're the hosts of Were You Raised by Wolves? Each week, we try to make the world a kinder, nicer place. Well, that's the idea, at least. I mean, we try. Have you ever wondered what to do if you're ghosted? Or what to do when a friend asks you to borrow money? Or the proper way to eat Cheetos? You know, the big questions. So please find Were You Raised by Wolves wherever you listen. 